Wait a second. There's something big down there. He's out. He's out. He's right there. Right there. He's moving. He's moving. Right there. He's going through here. He's going through here. You got him. Got him. Yes. Yes. Rock formations towered like prehistoric giants as intense waves crashed upon the jagged outcrops. At high tide, the southern coastline of Africa is an unforgiving landscape that has been carved over millions of years. Yet when the tide rolls back, with it recedes the violence of the turbulent water, leaving behind an intricate catacomb of intertidal pools that are teeming with aquatic life. Today we are exploring a stretch of pristine shoreline known as Kenton on Sea, a magical place where the South Atlantic meets the Indian Ocean, and to say the least, it's breathtakingly beautiful. The sand was flawless, the waves of water were warm, and with any luck, we would happen upon and get up close with a variety of bizarre tide pool creatures. Uh, the tide is going out at this point. Looks like it's still coming in, but it's actually the best time to search for animals. When all the rocks are still saturated, that means that the animals are still comfortable, which gives us the best chance of actually catching them. The water trapped within the individual pools was crystal clear. So as I scouted from pocket to pocket, I carefully scanned the overhanging ledges and shadowy nooks. If there was ever a place for a sea beast to hide, I was determined to be the seeker. We've got a decent sized crab down here in this little rock pool. There's actually a little blenny next to it as well, which is a small little fish that'll oftentimes sit on the edges of these little cliffs. It's tempting to not go for them both at the same time. We'll see what happens. I'm really after the crab though. I'm gonna use this net because it's a deep pocket of water Got it! Yes! Yeah. Wow, what a scoop! I almost got the blenny at the same time! All right, that's a pretty decent sized little crab right there. Look at you! Look at those distinct striped markings on the legs. Now I'm gonna actually have to look this one up in a field guide. I'm not sure exactly what species it is. Let me keep it in the net like that just for a second. Uh oh! Oh. oh. Okay! And I lost him. Hold on. Oh, I got a blenny! Two of them! Okay, game on! All right, well, Lost I... the crab, got a blenny. Oh, there's the crab. Got him! Now I've got the crab and some blennies! Wow! Hold on, that's how you got away the first time. Look at that! How's about that for cleaning up your mess? All right, well, this is really panning out well for us. Look at these guys. Come here, buddy. I got two of them in one scoop. All right, let me keep the crab underneath the net. He'll be fine. They can breathe out of water. Look at that. Those are blennies. Those are super cool. They almost look like mud skippers or like an eel type fish. Notice the elongated shape of the body. Kind of looks like a prickleback. And they do have those long dorsal ridge fins that run down the length of their backs. They actually can breathe for a short amount of time out of the water. So we don't have to worry about them just resting up on my hand. And they can actually skip from pocket of water to pocket of water. What they'll oftentimes do is exactly, oh my gosh, there's an octopus. Nobody move. That's a huge octopus. Okay, Are you sure? I'm 100% positive. Um, I'm gonna let the crab go. All right, I'm going for the octopus, guys. We're abandoning the crab. I see him. Nobody move. I can see its tentacle, Mario. If you crouch down here, you might be able to get a shot. Actually, I wonder if I can use my GoPro Wedge right into that little cavity. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. 
I'm gonna actually place my net up in this area, try to reach my arm around, and scare them up into the net. Now the good thing is that none of the octopus species here in South Africa are lethal to humans. Keep in mind, if we were in Australia, and that was a blue ring octopus, I would not be performing this maneuver. Now, all octopus are capable of biting, all are venomous, but hopefully this one doesn't decide to give me a nip. He's out, he's out, he's right there. He's right there. He's right here. I see him, I see him. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Dude. You see him? Where? Right there, right there, right there. Right there, he's moving. He's moving. Right there, he's coming from here. He's coming from here. You got him. Got yes! it! Yes! Woo! Woo! How about that? <laughs> well, the tactic worked. Gently coaxed him out of one pocket and into the next, and there you have it. We have got ourselves an octopus. Wow! I'm gonna actually let him out of the net and onto my arm. Hopefully, I do not take a bite. There you go, buddy. Now, they do have a little beak on their underside that of course he could give me a bite with, but the venom of this species is non-lethal. This is the common octopus. They can get bigger than this, but to be honest with you guys, this is the largest octopus I have ever caught, and it is on the move. Wow, look at it just showing us its valves. Right now I'm trying to keep it as calm as I can. I don't want it to ink. And look how it's turning dark in coloration, but if I do this, check this out, set it down, and sort of try to corral it into this pool. What it wants to feel is like it's protected. Look at that color change. Within a matter of seconds, it completely morphs the shape of its body and its coloration. Got an okay shot there? Yeah. This is actually great. You can see it pumping water through the valves on the side of its head. If I keep it like this, it will feel more comfortable. They want to feel concealed. Wow, look at that. And they want to feel like they are hidden. And just like if I were to handle a snake, I want to go one hand to the next. The octopus have eight tentacles, and one of the coolest things about these creatures is that if they lose a tentacle, they can rejuvenate it. Wow, that is so cool, like a big slimy booger. All right, I'm gonna place it back down into this pocket of water. Here we go, keep in position, and I'm getting totally slimed right now. All right, now if I just keep my hand positioned, watch the way that it will actually slink I guess it's gonna go over my arm. I thought he was gonna go under my arm. And as the tide goes out, if these animals are stuck in a shallow pool, they can do this. Slink from pocket of water to pocket of water. That is so cool. Now, one of the key defense tactics of all octopus, octopuses for plural, is that they can actually eject ink. And that allows them the ability to disappear into a rock crevice or back into the ocean waters. Now, if the octopus needs to, it can actually stay out of the water for a significant amount of time. And the only reason you'd ever find an octopus out of water is if it's moving from tide pool to tide pool. As that tide recedes, the octopus, if it's not in a deep enough pocket, will oftentimes try to find itself back out into the ocean currents. Look at that. Well, how cool was this? Exploring the tide pools of South Africa, and we managed to come across one slippery, slimy octopus. Whoa! All right, buddy, back into your tide pool. As I released the octopus back into its watery realm, we witnessed an incredible sight, the most classic octopi defense maneuver, ink and jet. Whoa! It's got ink. And as it disappeared back into the cavernous rocks, I came to the realization that never before had a single pool of ocean water provided us with so many species. This isolated miniature biome was an absolute goldmine of bizarre aquatic creatures, and I felt incredibly fortunate to have successfully gotten so many of them up close for the cameras. If there is one ecosystem on the planet that is constantly changing, it has to be the tide pools. With every single rising and falling of the tide, new waves crash upon the rocks and alter the placement of plants and animals. Along the coast of California, there are a slew of creatures that you can find if you know exactly where to look. A little striped crab right here. Oh, got it. There's definitely no shortage of crabs out here in these tide pools. However, 
Navigating this terrain can be difficult because most of the rocks are wet and slippery. But one of the toughest things so far for me in filming beyond the tide has been the terrain. I'm used to swamps and deserts. Everything here is rocky and slippery. It's all covered in a layer of, I guess it's some sort of algae and using a lot of eye foot coordination because I'm looking for creatures and every step I take, your foot might slip off of something and these rocks are extremely jagged. Really easy to get hurt out here. And I'm sure for you, Mark, it's even more difficult. Right now you're balancing on these rocks just trying to get the shots. Yep. Sure everybody at home. <laughs> It isn't easy, is it? Nope. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep going this way and see what we can find. Watch your footing. Oh, yep, see, there you go. I'm usually pretty good at finding animals in the field, but sometimes a wildlife expert joins us to help locate the species that can be very difficult to find. Today I'm back out with tide pool expert Aaron Sanchez, who has been exploring these Southern California pools his entire life. And our goal is to locate a giant sea slug. All right, Aaron, so we're here at the tide pools and we're looking for slugs. What should I be keeping my eye out for? Well, Cody, these slugs are gonna be pretty hard to miss. They're actually the largest sea slug on the planet. They come to these rocky shores here to mate and lay their eggs. Okay, now when you say the largest, do you mean like five to six inches in length or are we talking bigger? We're talking probably almost a little bit less than three feet. A three foot slug? So it's gonna be pretty hard to miss. Yeah. All right, well, let's start searching. The search was on and I was confident that I could come across one of these giants. I mean, if they're as big as Aaron says they are, spotting one should be simple, right? Hi, we've been searching for about 45 minutes now through all these layered rocks. I don't know, Aaron said it was gonna be easy. Nothing yet. We continued to search over jagged outcrops, in crevices, through knee deep pools, and even under rocks. I'd say the odds of finding one of these slugs are slim to none. Coming in. Yeah, it's coming in big time, and all I've seen is crabs, crabs, crabs. Hermit crabs, striped crabs, purple shore crabs, no giant slugs. With the tide starting to come back in, it was looking like our search for the giant sea slug was coming to an end. But if anyone knows how to find a sea creature, it's definitely Aaron. Searching, searching, no big slugs. Oh, you got one? Come on, come on, come on. Right over here, guys. It's you. Oh my gosh, look at the size of that thing. Wow, dude. Wow. Yes. Well, that was one heck of a search. And there it is. Can I pick it up? You can. It's totally safe. And it's not going to ink me. It might be a little slimy, but that's it. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. Right, here we go. Oh my gosh, is it slimy. Oh, <laughs> look at that slug. Oh my gosh, it is heavy. Jeez, this thing must be about almost 10 pounds, I would guess. Is that a big one, Aaron? Oh, it's a pretty good size, yeah. It's one of the bigger ones I've seen. Wow. I'm gonna let it stretch out of my arms, see if we can get it to fully elongate itself. Oh my gosh, it is so slimy. All right, now tell us about this slug, Aaron. Well, Coyote, what he's wrapping around your arm right now is actually his muscular foot. He uses that to get around. I can feel him gripping onto my arm. I mean, I can feel him actually like wrapping around me and I can feel his little tongue under there. Can't bite, right? No, these guys are vegetarians. They mostly eat algae and kelp. Okay. And it does have an internal shell, correct? Where um, it has all of its organs? It does have an internal shell. It's kind of soft and made of protein. Okay. And that is actually what these extensions of its foot called parapodia are protecting. I can see why there's no way you would miss stumbling upon one of these. I have to admit, I was just over there talking to Mark. I literally said, I'm really doubting our chances of finding one of these slugs. All we've seen all day is crabs and smaller little brown sea hares. Which, by the way, we should grab one of those. Is there one over here? Let's see him next to each other. Yeah. All right, you got one of those brown sea hares? Okay, so this is, this is cool, showing the comparison of the giant black sea slug next to the much smaller brown sea slug. And they're both called sea hares, because as you can see, those tentacles sticking up in the air, in the front of the head, look like rabbit's ears. I thought the brown sea hare was big. <laughs> yeah, seriously, there is no mistaking the difference between these two species. Wow, that thing is absolutely massive. It weighs about 10 pounds, and fully stretched out, it's about two feet in length. That is crazy, and it is so unbelievably slippery. It's actually really hard to hold on to it and my hands and arms right now are covered in a slippery mucus. 
Now, are they toxic in any way? No, they're not. Okay, so I'm in no danger right now. So they don't bite, they're not toxic, they're just slimy and alien looking. So how do these defend themselves against predators? Well, you know, these guys don't have as many predators as the California sea hare, probably due to their size. Okay. So they would generally just kind of stick to where they are and they're gonna be pretty well hidden in these rocks. I can't even imagine what would want to try to eat this. And it's just so amazing how big this slug is. When you said to me, yeah, we're gonna go out, we're gonna catch a giant slug, I honestly didn't believe you when you said they could grow to be about two feet in length. And until I actually had this animal in my hand, really on my arm, I didn't believe it. This is absolutely amazing. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for having us out today to explore the tide pools here in San Pedro. I think there's no question about it. This is one big black slug. We gently placed these two slimy slugs back into their respective pools and watched as they slowly returned to the wild. I think it's fair to say that these creatures are as primordial as it gets. And while they may be incredibly bizarre looking, they are an important part of the tide pool ecosystem. Ooh, it's almost time to head out to sea. How you feeling? Well, you'd think I'd be excited, which I guess I am, but I'm also out there looking for my fate, which is ultimately being stung by a lionfish. That's our boat. All right. Watch your step coming down here. Life Aquatic. All right, wow, well, we've got a lot, of, a lot of great space on board here to set up all of our gear. Not diving today, we're actually gonna free dive. Yeah, we are going to be snorkeling to get these lionfish. They'll be in shallower water. Now they are located deeper and shallow. I mean, they're all over the place from what I hear. So we've got about six hours out on the water and hopefully in that amount of time, we're gonna come back with a lionfish. Today we are heading off the coast of Isla Morada. We will be searching for one of these invasive fish with the ultimate goal of showing you how to treat the effects of their painful sting, which is often experienced by both fishermen and divers. Native to the Indo-Pacific, these fish were first reported off of Florida's Atlantic coast in 1985 and quickly began to spread up the eastern seaboard. With no natural predators beside humans, the lionfish has become invasive enemy number one. No one knows for sure how these fish were introduced to the area, but their numbers have increased rapidly over the last 30 years. So finding one should not be that difficult. All right, guys, well, we've made it to our first dive site. We are just off of the Florida Keys. You've got the shore in the background. And we're not too far out. You can actually see the bottom of the ocean just off the back of the boat, which is perfect for snorkeling. I'm gonna trade in my adventure cowboy hat for mask, a snorkel, and a dive suit. We're gonna head down there and try to catch the notorious lionfish. This is one of the most invasive species out here in these waters. And our captain tells us there is a 100% chance we're gonna catch one, which means for you guys, definitely going to be stung. Oh boy. Here we go. All right, Mario. All right, buddy. Oh, man. See you later. See ya. Positioned just off of a shallow reef, we began to explore the craggy rocks. The slow-moving lionfish is very distinct with its feathery-looking fins and calm disposition. As long as we spotted one, catching it should be no problem. In total, we searched for about 30 minutes. It didn't take long at all, because soon enough, we had a lionfish in our sights. I see it. Yep. It came back out with the coral. This is floating there. All right, let's try to get it. This was my moment. Time to net the invader. I held my breath and kicked hard. Closing in on the fish, I scooped forward. And after a little finesse of the net, I made the catch. I did it. I caught a lionfish. 
Making sure to keep the spines away from myself and the crew, I swam toward the surface. Got him. There you have it. What a beauty. Wow, this freaking run for it. Did you see that? Yeah. Oh, man. Did you get that? That was awesome. Wow. Okay. We'll stay back. Stay back a little bit for me. Uh, let's head back to the boat. We got our fish. Let's do it. Woo! There it is, ladies and gentlemen. The lionfish. Oh, there Look it out is. for that here. I'll, uh, I'll grab break that up. Yeah. Look at that fish. Beauty, too. Gorgeous. Wow. There you have it. Look at those spines. I would say that the stage is set for me to be stung by the lionfish. Okay, let's get it into this bucket and let's get back to shore. <laughs> In case you were wondering, this invasive fish will not be released back into the wild, but instead will be donated to a research group in South Florida. Okay. I see a tank. We need a fish. Here comes the fish. Now, I'm going to just scoop it up with this spoon and plop him into the aquarium. You ready? Yep. Here he comes. One, two, three. Whoop. There you go, buddy. Wow. You can see why people keep them in their aquariums. Oh, they're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you can see why it's called a lionfish. With those pectoral fins all spread out, it almost looks like the mane of a lion. Now, they're also known as red zebra fish. As you can see, those red stripes kind of make it look like a red zebra. Many different names for this fish, but one thing and one thing only that we know is that this is an invasive species here in South Florida and they can give you a pretty nasty prick with those spines. Now, let's look at some of the anatomy of this fish. Whew. Wow. First of all, those dorsal spines that you see running along the top ridge of the fish, all 13 of those are laced with venom. The venom on these spines is actually in grooves that run along the side of the spines. And you can see those fleshy things hanging off the side, right? Yeah, what is that? See that? These are actually sheaths that the spines are in. So when the fish gets agitated, those spines come through the fleshy sheaths and then the venom is exposed. So whatever gets, you know, spined onto there, has the venom go into its system. So those sheaths actually help put venom on the spines too, right? They do. It kind of lubricates it with venom. And then when the spine goes into your hand, well, that's how the venom enters your body. Now there are a couple different methods that I could use to go about being yeah, you just, let's, how are here. you going to do this? This seems really precarious to Well, me. the most dangerous thing and the thing that would be really unintelligent would be to actually put my hands in like this and try to pick up the fish from the side. The ventral spines are shorter and thicker and they will actually put more venom into me than I care to have put into my body today. The dorsal spines also will inflict a lot of venom, but I want to replicate what oftentimes happens to divers when they run into these fish, which is getting spined by the dorsal ridge. So I'm going to pick the fish up by its jaw. It's not going to hurt it in any way whatsoever. That dorsal ridge of spines is going to fan up like that because it's going to feel threatened. It's out of the water and I'm going to whack my hand down on top of those spines and venom is going to go into my skin. <sighs> well, you've gone through some stings and some bites. How are you feeling about this particular experiment, if you will? Well, this will be my first marine stinging. Technically, it's not a sting. It's a stabbing or a barbing or a spiking. Um, and I'm a little nervous because I don't know how my body will react to marine life venom. Um, we do have an epinephrine pen with us, as always. We're also back here in civilization, so if anything goes extremely wrong, if my body were to go into anaphylactic shock, we do have local medical experts on call, ready to receive me if something bad happens. And you're, you're good to go with this. <sighs> no, I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm nervous. My heart is racing. You can see the fish is completely calm right now, just there resting on the, on the bottom of the... Oh, oh. Ooh, <laughs> that's how you get that's, it. That scared me. There's, he there's flicked water his tail at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how that'll make you jump. Well, I thought I was going to get it from the uh, the ventral spines. There are three large spines on the back that they'll flick your tail and get you with. Um, he didn't get me there, which is good. But um, 
think we're getting close. Whew. Okay, we are just literally a couple minutes away from me being stung by the lionfish. Ah, oh, you guys know I get nervous right before I do these things. Oh, those are some big spines. I've never been spined by a marine creature before. I have no idea how my body's gonna react to this venom, which makes me even more nervous. It is time. GoPro is officially rolling. Okay, now I'm gonna pick the fish up from the front of its jaw and then I'm going to drop my hand on top of the spikes. Now, I may be spined in the process of getting it out of there. If that happens, I'm just gonna run with the scene, okay? Depending on how bad it is, okay? okay? I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm actually gonna use the wooden spoon to turn it around. I wanna hold it with my left hand I'm actually going to position it. Look at that. Look at how it's turning the spines into the spoon. Can you see that? Yeah, it's like instinctively like positioning the spines to it sure attack is. its uh, predator. Okay, I'm going to try to get it by the mouth. You ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. Careful. Careful. Got it. You have the mouth? Got it by the mouth. Here we go. There it is. Oh my goodness. We're Look here at the at display the of those spines. Wow. Okay. Now I'm going to drop my hand down on top of those. You got a decent shot. Yeah. Can you uh, position the fish a little more at me? Yeah. Let me kind of hold it out like that so you can see it. Oh wow. I cannot believe you're about to do this. Oh buddy. I'm Coyote Peterson and I'm about to enter the spike zone with the lionfish. One, two, here we go. Three. You all right? Did he get you? Oh, yeah. Tell me what you're feeling right now. What's it feel like? Does it hurt? Oh, pinpricks. Oh. Yep. Oh man. It's actually really not that bad. But yeah. it is, keep in mind, a neurotoxin. It's gonna take a couple minutes for this to set in. It's not instantaneous like a wasp, tarantula hawk, or even the bullet ant. You see where the spines went in. There, there, and I think his body kind of turned. I got like four spinings. Is it hot? Nope. Fingers are getting a little stiff. Uh. Mm. Mm. Yep, I'm feeling something now. <laughs> uh. mm. uh. Hold on a second. Ooh. Ooh. The fish is okay. Fish looks good. That's what you get, he says, for picking me up. Uh. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. Oh, ah, it's kind of coming in a wave. Oh, you know what that's indicative of? Heal a monster. Heal a monster. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right, I'm going to take this thing off of my wrist. Yeah, feeling any swelling? Or... Yep, I can feel my arm getting tight. And this is actually cutting off the circulation. And what you don't want to do is cut off the circulation. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Dude, feel my feel my forearm, dude. <laughs> That's like instant. Squeeze under here, under oh, yeah. there. Oh yeah. Jeez. Ah. Uh, arms on. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's burning good now. Ah. I felt the spikes go in, and thought to myself, oh, that's kind of like a pinprick. A uh, big pin, but a pinprick nonetheless. I kind of got up and said. That's not that bad. How long will this last? Oh. It's gonna last until I get my hand in some hot water. Not boiling hot. I want as hot as I can stand because that heat will actually break down the proteins in the venom. 
and it should dissipate, but oh wow. Okay, it's getting worse, guys. It's getting worse and I'm getting dizzy. Hey, should, Marge, should we take it to get uh, the hot water? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> we should probably wrap this up. Okay, okay. No, 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 no. Gotta get an outro. Okay. Well, as we can see, the sting from the lionfish is extremely painful. If you are stung, seek medical attention as quickly as possible. You never know how your body is going to react to venom in a, in a situation like this. It's an invasive species. It's a fish. It's a fish that's very easy to come across here in the southern part of Florida and up and down the east coast of the United States. If you see a lionfish in the wild, just admire it from a safe distance. It's the most important thing you do. Do not try to capture these fish. Okay, I'm getting dizzy. Here, just sit down a minute, sit down. Uh, okay, let's get you home. Here, uh, Oh man, dude, I'm light right, I'm light right. I'm light yeah. <laughs> All right, maybe it is a little worse than I thought. Hi, right, Mario, you got the keys? As the sun breaks through the clouds and shines down upon my face, there are two things on my mind. The first is that Alaska is absolutely breathtaking. The second is that in just a couple minutes, I will be pinched by a giant Dungeness crab. Wait, what? Yep, you heard me right, pinched by a giant crab. Today we are in Haines, Alaska, and our first stop is the dock. So if you want to get pinched by Dungeness crab, you got to have the crab first. And I can't dive down to the bottom of the ocean to catch one, so today we're heading to the harbor so I can buy one. Dungeness crabs live in deep water and are usually caught using crab pots. So for us to make this episode work, we actually have to buy a crab. That one. Well, there you go. That looks like it'll do the trick right there. That's a pretty big set of pinchers. I think we all know what's gonna happen next. The good news for the crab, who I have endearingly named Roscoe, is that after I am pinched, he is going to be released back into the wild. All right, well, I've got my crab. Now we're just gonna take it to a good spot that we can film me getting pinched. You know, the entire time I was hoping that this fisherman would never come back with these crabs. Now we have one pointer finger is going to feel the power of that claw pinch. I'm honestly pretty nervous right now. It's going to break my finger. They have these huge teeth looking nodules on their claws. I didn't know they had those until I saw them. I'm kind of having second thoughts about this. Dwelling primarily in eelgrass beds, the Dungeness crab gets its name from the town of Dungeness, Washington. It's one of the largest crab species in this region and is armed with a set of powerful claws that would even make a lobster jealous. I know what you were thinking. Coyote, why are you going to do this? And the answer is simple. To find out just how powerful these crabs really are, can they break a human finger? We're about to find out. All right, Coyote, so does the crab seem bigger in person? Is it as big as you thought it would be? Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I've never really seen a full-grown Dungeness crab. I did picture something a bit smaller in my head. He's down there in the water right now. We just have water flowing through his gills. We're actually allowing him to power up, if I dare say power up, to make this pinch a little more extreme. Grumpy old Roscoe, getting ready to do a number on my pointer finger. Oh boy, this is going to be bad. The pinch of any crab species has the potential to be very painful. And if the crab, like this one, is big enough, there is a chance it could actually break a finger. This is it. This is for science. Here we go. Bring it up. Oh boy, he looks grumpy. In the past, I've been pinched by several species of crab. Remember the purple shore crab? That one hurt. You look at this crab and you're probably thinking to yourself, coyote, that one's like 10 times the size. Yeah, it is. And take a look at those claws. They are armed with little serrated teeth. Now what I'm gonna do today is put my pointer finger into one of those claws to see just how powerful that pinch really is. Oh, I have a feeling that this is going to hurt. As long as it doesn't break my finger, I'm going to let this crab pinch me for 60 seconds. Never attempt to replicate 
what you are about to witness. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the pinch zone with the Dungeness Crab. Ready? Let's do it. One, two, here we go, three. Ah! Oh! Oh, wow, that's pretty bad. Ah! Ah, can you see that? Oh, he's got my whole finger locked in there. Oh, it's like right on the joint. Oh my gosh, the teeth are definitely just digging into my finger. Ah! Oh my gosh. Ah! Oh my gosh, that hurts so much more than I thought it was going to. These crabs actually use their pinchers for defense and also to catch their food. Oh, hold on, absorb the pain. Oh, I gotta try to get my finger out, man. It's crushing my finger. Hold on, put it down the rock. Oh, my God. Oh, that hurt. Man, look at all those dents. Oh, that hurt. That was like having your finger in oh, a new set of vice grips. Man! Oh. oh, that was worth it for science. Holy cow, I'm uh, actually a little nervous that he may have like stress fractured the bone. Look at my finger, you see the crush marks? Uh, it's actually the, the pinches of the, the teeth that I think hurt the worst because I can feel those sticking down in the bone. Oh, man, Roscoe, Woo! you little, you little bugger. Wow, well, I can now say without a doubt that the pinch of the Dungeness Crab Oh, that's pretty bad. Is by far the worst I've ever experienced. All right, Roscoe, let's get you back off into the ocean. As I placed Roscoe into the murky ocean waters, I am pretty sure that I saw a little smile on his face just before he disappeared into the unknown. Cool. Well, there he goes. Roscoe is back off into the ocean, and I still have my finger. Awesome. As for my finger, it was sore for a week, but completely free of any real damage. Today we are creating a worst case scenario. Imagine you're out for a day of fun in the Florida Keys, and your boat runs into rocks in a sandbar, and you become stranded. Now, you don't want to cook in the sun, so you try to make it to an uninhabited island. Will there be enough resources to save you until you get picked up? Wilson, wildlife biologist and Florida Keys expert. What is it that we're going to try to recreate? We are here because of a miniature dachshund by the name of Keely was stranded on the island right behind us for 30 days. So me and Coyote are going to try it for just 24 hours. We have been provided with dry bags that have minimal supplies and some production gear. But behind us is a broken down catamaran filled with junk which gives us the opportunity to scavenge a few more items. I say we each grab three things that will help us on our journey. You wanna go first? Sounds good to me. How's it looking in there? Uh, it's looking pretty scary. I, I did find a life jacket though. Really? Yeah, here we go. Hey, that's yeah, usable. I don't, I don't know, yeah. It's got a lot of foam, got a lot of plastics. Oh God, it's disgusting in here. And uh, we, got some, uh, we got some trap line. We could definitely use some of this. All right, I found my third item. <laughs> this disgusting cup. This is gonna be gross. I really need to watch out for all these sharp things. Oh, scissors. Super rusted, but you could use that to easily spear something like a fish. Item number one. So I'm gonna give it a quick scout, just like Christina did. And I don't know how she missed this, but that's a boat hook. That could be super useful, actually. This thing right here might be a better flotation device. Okay, we've collected a few good resources, and the last thing you want to do if you're going to abandon your boat is try to leave a note telling somebody what direction you're headed, and hopefully you have a chance to rescue. 
Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is scour this smaller island for some resources. No fresh water, no food. This island is definitely slim pickings. We are going to be leaving the small island and heading across to the big one. How far do you think that is? I'd say over half a mile. Yeah, from here it looks a lot further than you would think. Uh, but the big danger right now is going to be sea urchin, stingrays, and sharks. What it long spine sea urchin right in here. Long spine right there. And that's venomous. See any sharks yet? I actually did see something over here. Really? Yeah, I just saw a fin. Are you kidding or no? I'm not, I'm not kidding. So you saw a fin between here and the island. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a good size. Uh, this is a really healthy area. A lot of things for uh, sharks to feed on. We can most definitely see a very dangerous bull shark, which within the last month, we have had three shark attacks believed to be bull sharks here in the Florida Keys. So it's, it's a real deal right now. All right, so the crew with the leaving of that drone is leaving us in the middle of the ocean in chest deep water quite possibly with bull sharks. All right, go ahead, you keep going. I'm gonna try to get these higher perspective shots of you. Oh. What'd you see? Oh. What? Something, what, what? There was something there. There was something there. Really, really, for real? I, I'm very serious. I'm very serious. There's something there. It's, it's right is it in a, front Is of it a ray or a shark? Did I don't you know, see it? dude. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, this is I like... I didn't see a fin, but it made a movement like a shark. It did not look like a ray. It's chasing something. It's hunting right now. We have made landfall. I can only imagine what it would have been like for Kiwi getting swept through the ocean, avoiding sharks and making it to landfall. That poor little dog washed ashore thinking, I am so far from home right now. The first thing that we want to do is circumnavigate this piece of land. So what we'll do is I will give you a GoPro. You go one direction, I'll go the other. Let's see what additional resources we can collect. I'm a little hesitant right now. Holy cow. I've seen a lot of different mangroves and there's something, something in the tree over here actually. A coconut. <laughs> what? Yeah! <laughs> what is that? A coconut! <laughs> that is a lifesaver right there. There is a flow of water coming from the interior of the island. <clears throat> Definitely salt. This coconut's getting heavy, man. This is like holding a baby. You're so heavy, baby coconut. Why? Whoa, here's one of those urchin. Look at that. It's like walking through a minefield. Urchin, urchin. Wild Christina, hopefully she's having better luck than me when it comes to finding stuff. You made it! Holy yeah. cow, you have a coconut. Believe it or not, the first thing I found <laughs> was a brown coconut. Cheers. <laughs> Woo! All right, so the items that we have been given in our dry bags. So there you have it, very minimal kit. But I gotta say, my favorite thing is the stuffed kiwi. So when you really break it down, and you think about the items that were given to us, it's very, very bleak. The next task will be to explore the interior and see if we can find a place to possibly make shelter. Oh, look at this. Is this all solid? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think this is the best spot right here from what we've seen so far. It's just really hoping that we're not gonna get ripped up by bugs tonight. Oh, the geocache! <laughs> oh, you found it! Or should I read the, the note that's left to us? Oh, yeah. Have a great day. This is fantastic. Okay. You are lost and on your own. Amidst the struggle, here's a bone. If all your hope is bleak, then these treasures your soul will seek. Hot broccoli. This, I'm assuming, was frozen at one point. Socks, actually. Barbecue socks. This. Really, you guys? Really? Ooh. Coconut milk. Dude, good find. This is good find. We have made cordage. We have made cordage. Talk to me, girl. We took that twine and made three different cordages out of it. So we are in the right realm right now. And Coyote at this moment is pulling a really great Les Stroud look right now. I am. And by embodying the spirit of Les, I feel I'm going to bring more to this production. <laughs> 
You're stupid. <laughs> That's the dumb, dumbest thing I ever said. But I love you, Les. All right, when we come back to you guys, this shelter is going to be up and rocking. We did it. We made shade. Yeah. <laughs> How long did this take us? I would say a good two hours. Middle of the afternoon, sun is directly overhead. It is so unbearably hot. I'm trying to cool off. What you doing, dude? I'm doing that. <laughs> Kiwi! How you doing, buddy? Kiwi stole my bandana. Actually, Kiwi might make a nice pillow later. Dude, I was about to steal Kiwi to make a pillow for myself. I feel like if we get into those coconuts, it's gonna be a huge confidence boost for us in like 10 minutes. Welcome to Coyote and Christina's Island Kitchen. <laughs> you ready to open some coconuts? I'm so ready. So this, you gotta really yeah, kind of okay. wedge down and work your way into it. And Christina's doing a pretty darn good job getting into that coconut. Right. That's like hair. <laughs> That's beautiful. A lot of effort, That's beautiful. but there you have it. I'm gonna just chip away some of this hard edge. There we go. <sighs> Look at that cute little face. <laughs> All right, folks, here we go. Christina is going to be having <laughs> her first coconut experience. All right, here we go. Hopefully I'm not gonna spill any. That's okay. gonna be awesome. Wow, that was really good. That was really good. <laughs> wow, it is delicious. Here we go, cutting into the skin of the green coconut. There we go, using all, all extremities here. I'm like a man monkey. <laughs> Woo. Good to have you off. Yeah, thanks girl, appreciate it. Kiwi, buddy. <laughs> that was tough. Ah, you gotta make a sound effect when you do it. It really helps out. That's what all the guys do in the gym, right? Yeah. Ah, wow, it's like, I feel like I'm breaking someone's leg when I'm doing this. He's <laughs> <laughs> got a mohawk. It's a Wilson. It's a Wilson. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm not even kidding. This thing is filled to the brim with water. Oh. Mm. Game changer. Wow. All right, well, there you have it. Cooking with Coyote and Christina <laughs> and Kiwi. This has been Coconut Breakfast Part 2, Coconut Lunch. Cheers. When it comes to things that Kiwi may have eaten stranded on this island, there's a massive supply of hermit crabs. If that little dog could get one to flip upside down and it starts to pull out of its shell, bite down onto it, that would make quite a bit of nutrients for a small dachshund. How pretty is that? Whoa, that one's awesome. Wow, look at that. Wow, that's a big, that's a big pincher claw. Now, hermit crabs, as they grow, will move from shell to shell. Uh, the crab continues to grow, but the shells do not, so they have to find a new shell to move into. Oh wow, that is a big one. That is a monstrous hermit crab. Doesn't its legs look like strawberries? They do. It's actually trying to grip onto my finger right now. I'm really hungry, and it's not like me to typically want to take an animal from the wild, but given today is a survival scenario, if we can catch a fish or a spiny lobster, we have a license and the permit to do so. So what I'm gonna to try to build now is a spear. And the thing that I'm most excited about that I salvaged from that broken down catamaran, this rusty pair of scissors. It seems like a really good thing to pin a lobster or a fish with. All right, so with this stick, it's kind of a neat design already as it is. You see that? It's almost like a double scissor system. So I'm really thinking that it's all about getting the scissors to be locked in place on the stick. Okay, got my first piece of paracord attached on. We are ready to go out and try to catch some dinner. I see a huge crab. Whoa, it's totally mummified. Look at the pincher on that. You gotta, ooh, he stinks. Well, I guess I feel like you could hang out with us for a bit tonight yeah. when we make a fire. It's kind of got a personality, we you know? We have some island decor. Yeah. Let's use it. My stomach is very angry with me. So I'm hoping to catch some fish right now. Ready for this scene? I would say yes, I is. <laughs> now you're going to attempt fishing with the freshwater fishing lure, correct? Yes, I am. My goal is to maybe tickle out and then pin a spiny lobster. In all honesty, 
I give myself a one in 10,000 chance that I could actually spear a fish. Whoa, that is huge. Look how big that is next to my hand. I'm so hungry and our odds of catching a fish are so slim. I really had like this big vision in my mind that like, we'll catch a, a snapper or something. I think we're gonna be eating the Swedish fish tonight. How about you? <laughs> I haven't gotten a single bite. <laughs> I just want a cheeseburger. Wilson! What, I'm right here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You've got a lobster. Dude, it's halfway out of the hole right now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's a little guy, though. Not that guy can be edible. Oh! Okay, the sun is down. It's about 8 o'clock, and what have we caught? Nothing. Looks like we're going to be eating our rations. <laughs> well, we're back with no fish. No fish. And no lobsters. <laughs> and it got dark in a hurry, especially here in the shade and the noceums are starting to bite, which means we need to get our fire lit. All right, so one of the things that the crew supplied us with was this little emergency fire starter kit. In all fairness, I've never used one of these before. What I've prepared here is a little bit of tinder from our super dried out coconut. This tinder will hopefully catch a spark rather easily, but considering it's already dark, we really need this to happen quick. Yeah. I'm gonna see if I can make it happen with these little things. It's important to note, this is not a flame. This is just a little flint striker. So. This is spinning around and making a spark. It's not making a flame. So we have no fire, so this doesn't work. We are straight up out of luck. <laughs> no, that's not directions. Well, this is working better to do it. <gasps> yeah! It's just not catching. Come on, coyote, you can do it. A lot of smoke, not a lot of fire. I wonder if this little thing from the fishing lure yeah, good idea, will, maybe, will maybe burn. You could be our savior. He didn't catch us any fish, but maybe he'll make us a fire. Whoa. Yes, yes. <laughs> fire! <laughs> you don't want your teepee to collapse. So what I always do is look for good Y sticks, right? So you see this? See that there? Yeah. That Y, you anchor it in, and then you put other sticks on top and they hold in place so that it all doesn't collapse down. I am not good at survival by any means, but I do like starting campfires. Yeah, all right. The second you get a fire going, it's just like, you forget about being hungry. You forget that you're stranded. This comforting feeling is like your own world. We're glowing now. It got real dark in a hurry. We didn't see that coming, but now that we've got fire, we're in good shape. Yeah. That was awesome. Welcome back to another episode of Cooking with Coyote and Christina. What do we catch out there today in the ocean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we're gonna have to resort to the couple of supplies that we were given. Oh wait, I almost forgot to mention our other dinner guest. We have not named the dead crab We yet. should probably name him. Harry? Harry. Harry. Yeah, okay. Hey, Harry. Hey, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I can just smack these coconuts together and see if they'll break. I mean, you can go for it. I'm gonna try that like solid, like ooh, ooh, monkey style. Ooh. And just see what happens. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah! Wow! Are you serious? I'm for real. <laughs> I broke it right now. <laughs> now I say we grill up some delicious <laughs> Swedish fish. I'll go two at a time here for us. Let's see how the first two work out. Oh, gooey, right? gooey. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> wow. How are we gonna crack this thing open? I got a knife. Look at that color. Oh, oh. oh wow. I mean, wow. Is that good? <laughs> that is really good and really creamy. It has been a long day, my friends. We're gonna head out into the tide pools and see if we can still catch some fish using the stinky broccoli. With any luck, we'll catch something and the sharks won't catch us. So we have found something cool, a stingray. 
And this is exactly what we were hoping to not run into earlier today. Okay, so we're gonna try a little broccoli test here. Yeah. Ooh, this may be working. Fish may be coming in. It is not interested in this disgusting broccoli. Here, hold the GoPro. I'm gonna try the spear method. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Nurse shark. Beautiful. Came right in my foot. Yeah, and I was like, see you. They love the structure of the mangroves out here. I'm pretty sure that's an eel down in the rocks. It looks like an eel. Oh. So maybe gently move. Oh, careful! <laughs> <laughs> oh, careful, careful, careful. There's his tail. How beautiful is that? He's, oh, he's gonna slither back. Oh. There he goes. It is pretty late, almost midnight. We're super tired. I would love to keep going to try to get a lobster in the deeper area. We have definitely seen some big fish jumping at points tonight, and big fish jumping means bigger fish hunting for them. There are sharks out here, not worth losing your leg over. Head back to camp? Yes, sir. We're heading back to camp. We are back from our tide pool expedition. Uh, it is approaching 1.30 in the morning at this point, and we are absolutely exhausted. I think we're going to dial down the cameras and see if we can get a little bit of shut eye. I'm down. You think you're gonna be able to sleep? Probably not. Guess who can't sleep? You, Harry! Come on into the sea. <laughs> Back on your podium. Don't fall in the fire. Jump over the flames. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. Have a great day. Great day. At three in the morning, I prefer my coconut milk to come out of a coconut bowl. Would you like some, Harry? I didn't think so. Ghosts don't drink coconut milk. <gasps> I saw lightning in the background. Polar coconut milk. It's probably the worst night of sleep I've ever had. But let me show you my bedroom. This is where I slept, right there. I don't know where Christina is. Something must have come in the middle of the night and taken her away. Oh, there you are. Good morning. Hey, you're watching sunrise. I'm watching the sunrise. How'd you sleep? I uh, woke up about 10 plus times. And uh, if you didn't just hear it, there's a bird called the clapper rail. And they make this really wild noise and then a whole bunch of them start going in on it. So that's something that uh, has been keeping me up. And at some point, Coyote, your foot was partly in the fire. Really? And so I had to move your foot. <laughs> huh. Let's take a look at my foot. It was your left foot. That yeah, would be this one. Foot. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's still there. Yeah. I see part of the sun popping up right now. Oh, cool. All right, let's run this camera and get right. that shot. Final morning, and we're gonna be picked up in the exact same fashion that Kiwi was, by a wildlife biology team. That was a butterfly biologist that discovered Kiwi, but who's picking us up today? Today we are getting picked up by a team named Mang, and they are all about mangrove restoration here in Florida and actually in the Bahamas as well. In our survival kits, we were left with two emergency items. The first, a distress flag. The second is this really nice little whistle here. They can't see us, hopefully they can hear us. Okay, the boat sees us. There it is, we just gotta get all the way out there. Christina? Yeah. You ready? I'm so ready. Kiwi, you ready? Ready. All right, we've got a ways to go, but that's our boat. We're getting out of here. It was brutal. 
and I'm ready to get home. Oh, I don't know. Thank you. <sighs> well, we did it. We survived for 24 straight hours on the island that little Kiwi survived on for 30 days. We are hungry, we are thirsty, we are sun cooked. But this was one of the craziest challenges I think either of us has ever gone through. Most certainly. I'm Coyote Peterson. I'm Christina Wilson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Woo! We did it.